Hello and welcome back. In this video we will look at generative adversarial networks. Uh, these are a class of generative models which do not explicitly model the data distribution but rather provides a sample from it and the sampling is performed using a deep neural network. Uh, the net neural network which actually provides the samples takes as input a random noise vector and then maps it into a sample of the model distribution. So, let us say we have given you are given training data right p data of x which is in the provided based on the samples provided. So, x i where i is 1 to n. What we want to do is to model some provide a what we want to do is determine this model p model of x. So, that it is in a good approximation of p data the true distribution. Okay. So, this p data of x once again we do not actually have access to all the data that is possible. So, we only have samples from p data of x and we want to determine some p model which is basically the probability distribution of x a model for that so that we can sample from it. Now, in this case we do not explicitly model. So, in the sense it is not a parametric model, but rather this is accomplished using a, a deep neural network. Neural network actually generates a sample from the model distribution. So, we will see how this is done. The generative adversarial network uh, framework consists of uh, two neural networks one the generator and the discriminator. The, the function of the generator <coughs> is to take as input a random noise vector and transform it into a sample from the model distribution. And the discriminator's job is to it acts, acts, acts like a classifier wherein it tries to determine if its input data x came from the generator we will call them as fake samples or was it from the actual training distribution which was the real samples. Okay. Um, it is called adversarial because the generator is constantly trying to fool the discriminator into believing that into making the decision that uh, the sample generated by it is from the training distribution. While the discriminator is constantly trying to learn uh, the registry so that it always determines whether it is called an adversarial uh, network because it has these two networks generator and discriminator trying to work against each other like as I mentioned earlier the generator constantly trying to generate samples that will fool the discriminator into classifying it as coming from the training data distribution. So, in that process the weights of the generator learns a transformation which, which uh, enables want to convert the random data random noise input vector into a sample from the uh, model distribution. So, just to have a uh, illustration of what we discussed. So, the generator g takes as input the generator g takes as input a, um, a random noise vector also referred or denoted by denoted by z also referred to as the latent space. This random noise vector is then given the which acts as input to the generator G, which then outputs some samples, generated samples of the which are which are hopefully similar to the training data distribution. The discriminator D takes as input your training data. So, again, these are samples or nothing but your training data which are made available to you. So, for instance, if you are interested in generating faces then you would have a database of faces of different people and that would be the input to the discriminator. So, it would not be a, a general purpose uh, algorithm it has to be specific to a certain task. So, the training data it takes as input training data which are labeled as real and the generated fake samples again they are labeled as fake. So, or you can say this is 0 label and this is the 1 label. So, discriminator alternatively tries uh, takes as input the samples training data samples as well as the generated samples and outputs an error function. So, basically it is the output of the discriminator which are basically outputs a probability of the particular sample being real or fake ranging from 0 to 1. Now, this output is what provides the signal or the error signal to 
train the weights of the generator as well as the discriminator. So, how is that done? This uh, problem is formulated as a zero sum game uh, so to speak because the, the generators if you call if you denote by j of j subscript g as the cost, cost function of the generator then it is basically the, op, the negative of the cost function of the discriminator which is denoted as j subscript d. So, the cost function of the generator is what is given here basically and is also referred to as a value function. It, it is actually a function of two sets of parameters one corresponding to the discriminator and other corresponding to the generator. So, uh, the, this is optimized uh, alternatively this is, uh, there is an inner and outer loop. So, the inner loop is maximizing the, um, the this, this value function with respect to the uh, discriminator network parameters the outer loop is minimizing this again the same objective function with respect to the parameters of the generator network. So, let us take a closer look at, at the cost function itself. So, the first term is log d of x which is nothing but the let us take a closer look at this cost function. So, if you look at this cost function which is expectation of log d of x plus the expectation over z log of 1 minus d of z. So, all, all this what this means is that you will calculate log d of x with respect to the training data samples and you will calculate this term with respect to the samples generated from z. Okay. So, this is very similar to the binary cross entropy assuming that there is an equal number of generated images and equal number of training data samples. Okay. So, this we will uh, we'll see wha wha how this uh, cost function makes sense minimizing this or maximizing this cost function makes sense in the context of the generator adversarial network. So, uh, here d g of z is basically the output of the discriminator when the generated images are or given as input. So, d of x goes from 0 to 1 basically you can think of it as a probability of this particular input sample belonging either being real or fake and similarly in, in when you are using the generated samples it would be d g of z which is again go between 0 to 1. Okay. So, so, if you look at this cost function, so when we start training, so if you look at it the discriminator ideally the output of the discriminator should be 1 whenever x comes from the training data distribution and the output of the discriminator should be 0 whenever the input comes from the generator. So, initially when the uh, discriminator is not sufficiently well trained the, weight, the weights of the uh, discriminator are not are still random. Then let us look at a particular case test case wherein we have real data here and some fake generated data which are given as input. What is shown here in this black um, hyphenated lines is basically the decision boundary given by the discriminator. So, here there is one misclassification of real data here right here and there is one misclassification of generated data. Okay. So, everything to the left of this line left of this line is basically class 0 everything to the uh, everything to sorry the everything to the left of this line is class 1 everything to the right is class 0. Now, when the discriminator misclassifies so which means that d of x is 0 when x comes from the training data ideally the output should be 1, but instead it says 0 then you can see that log d of x becomes a very large negative number right. Similarly, when you take the discriminate when you take the uh, data which comes from the generator ideally it should the output should be 0, but then if it is if there is a misclassification then once again d of g of z is close to 1 which means that log of 1 minus that becomes a very large negative number correct. So, this is the case when the discriminator is not performing optimally. On the other hand let us say it is trained very well and you will see that the samples are co correctly classified in the same input real data as well as fake data here. You will see that these this is the decision boundary right here and everything above is class 1 everything below is class 0 in which is case the decision boundary is correct. Then if you see that d of x is close to 1 then log d of x goes to 0 similarly d of g of z is close to 0 then log 1 minus that is again close to 0. So, your cost function varies from a very large negative number minus infinity to a um, close to positive number which is like in this case 0. Okay. So, maximizing this cost function uh, makes sense so that 
maximizing this will lead to the discriminator performing optimally. Similarly, when you try to look at minimizing the same uh, value function or cost function with respect to the parameters of the generative network. Now, if you take the first term, it does not have any parameters of the generator network. So, we, we will not consider that. So, we will only look at this particular term here. So, minimizing this term, what does it mean? It minimizing the likelihood of the discriminator cla classifying the uh, fake samples as fake. Basically, that is what we are trying to do here with this cost function. So, um, this is minimizing the uh, cost of correctly classifying g as 0. Okay. However, it turns out that this cost function saturates very quickly okay, because that is very easy because in initially when the generated images are of very poor quality, then the discriminator is, has no problems figuring them out as belonging to class 0. Okay. So, then what happens is that the output of the error output saturates. So, if you take the derivative which is what gives rise to the signal that we back propagate through the network, derivative becomes 0. So, there is not much to back prop. Okay. So, instead it is replaced by maximum of log d g of z. So, what this does is to maximize the error of the discriminated network, maximize the error in the discriminated network in the sense that it incorrectly classifies d of g of z as 1 instead of, instead of 0. So, ideally what we are trying to do is to force d of g of z to be close to 1 rather than it being close to 0. Okay, that is what this cost function does. So, maximizing the error of your discriminating network is what this cost function does and this provides this is this is a heuristic and it actually makes it better for training the neural network. So, we can just check that very easily. So, once again we have real data and fake data being fed into the uh, discriminator. So, when the network discriminator network correctly classifies the uh, output from the generator as being close to 0 then it becomes a very large negative number then log of d of g of z is a very large negative number. On the other hand when let us say the disc, the generator has, has progressed to a point where it is generating very realistic samples in that case let us say the discriminator comes uh, incorrectly in this case classifies the output from the generator as belonging to class 1 then you know that log of d of g of z becomes close to 0. Okay. So, then again once again maximizing this cost function with respect to the parameters of the generated network um, leads to the generator managing to uh, output samples which are very close to the training data distribution. Okay. So, let us uh, look at this learning process uh, in the terms of a 1D distribution this is again from the paper given I recited at the bottom. So, let us we have this uh, distribution data distribution in black shown here and let us say this is the model distribution from which which is learnt by the generator network and this is the the blue line is the output of the this is the discriminator response okay you can think of this as a decision boundary. So, initially when the training is uh, not initially when the training is not great we will see that there is some misclassification by the discriminator. Okay. So, uh, the misclassification you can judge by seeing that all points to one side of of the discriminator decision boundary is classified as real and all points on the other side let us say this side is classified as fake. Okay. So, then uh, after updating the discriminator so you do um, several epochs to the discriminator network and it gives rise to a decision boundary which is much better right now. So, it is able to correctly classify samples to some extent from the, uh, the real versus the um, uh, generators output. Okay. So, then what we do is in this case uh, just to have uh, explained further. So, this z this axis here this we are looking at a 1D problem. So, this axis here is z this is the random noise vector this is the space from which we sample the random noise vector. So, and the, the, the generated network maps this to points in x. So, x is the data so, it points it onto a data axis and the y axis here is the probability okay. this is the probability density function is what we are looking at. So, so z is mapped to x by the generator and it gives rise to this green line okay, uh, which is what we are trying to change. So, after updating d the blue line the blue dotted line is the uh, discriminated response it is getting better at, dis at discriminating between the data distribution and the model distribution. However, another, another epoch of updating the generated network leads to the green distribution moving closer to the 
dotted black distribution which is basically the model distribution is correctly approximating the true data distribution. And once training has been and once when uh, the both the discriminator and the generator have been optimally trained then you get to a point wherein the green and the black dots are coincidental and the discriminator is unable to clearly say which is what. So, in the sense that the output of the discriminator is always 0.5 which it is not uh, clear whether the data belongs to the training distribution training data distribution or, or it came from the generator ok. So, this is what the process is. So, you alternatively train the discriminator and the generator to a point where there is an equilibrium wherein the, the discriminator is not able to distinguish between the samples coming from the training data distribution or whether it is coming from the generator distribu uh, the distribution approximated by the generator. So, just to walk you through this is again from the paper and just to walk you through the uh, steps involved in the algorithm. So, you sample a mini batch of noise sample. So, remember the input to the generator are this uh, random noise vectors either from uniform noise or Gaussian noise you sample n m of them m is your mini batch size and you also sample a mini batch of m training data ok. So, again once we sample we of course, we run it through a generator to give outputs in the form of the data. So, then you update the discriminator by ascending on its stochastic gradient. So, we saw that we maximize the probability of the discriminator when we are trying to train it with this cost function. And once that is done this again for k steps. So, we said this is that loop we are in for k steps. And once again we sample a mini batch of m from the noise prior this is called the noise prior. So, this distribution from which you sample z is called the noise prior and then you update the weights of the generator again doing uh, in this case uh, the, uh, the original cost function is log of 1 minus that remember that we replace that by log of d of g of z. So, we have to do gradient ascent on it actually not gradient descent. So, this is gradient ascent to maximize this cost function. So, and so this alternates so typically you will do one step of or say several uh, one, one or two steps of the discriminator and then go back to the generator and train its weights ok. So, in this uh, particular construct this GANs construct both the discriminator and generator are neural networks. So, usually stochastic the uh, mini match gradient descent is used for updating the weights of the generator as well as the discriminator. So, we look at one um, very popular implementation of this GANs it is called DC GANs or deep convolutional generative adversarial network. So, this is one of the first uh, work it is cited work it's cited here it is one of the first uh, publications to use a deep convolutional network to, um, to generate actual images ok. So, the original paper which talks about GANs uh, used MNIST and it did not use uh, such deep convolutional networks ok. So, there are some um, heuristics that they uh, the authors figured out some of them are listed here. So, they replaced pooling layers in deep convolutional networks with slided convolutions ok. In the discriminator you have slided convolutions instead of max pooling and in the generator you have transpose convolutions remember that we start with a random noise vector and we have to actually generate images. So, you need to have transpose convolutions used batch normalization in both the generator and discriminator they removed most of the fully connected layers and they used relu activations in generator for all layers except the output which uses tan hyperbolic and used leaky relu for the discriminator for all layers. This uh, particular uh, heuristic seemed to work very well for them in few um, I urge you to read their paper where they have uh, were able to generate images that are not part of the training distribution, but still look very realistic ok. So, we will just look at the architecture quickly. So, you start with z you sample z from a distribution about 100 points or 100 dimensions and you have to reproject it to a volume of size 1024 feature maps of size 4 cross 4 and then you use strided convolution in this case they call it fractionally strided convolutions or transpose convolutions to increase the size of the feature maps to 8 by 8 at the same time reducing the number of feature maps this is the typical um, um, thing that is seen throughout the network. So, in the next uh, layer you have 
16 cross 16 feature maps with 256 feature maps in total and then 128 cross 128 feature maps with of size 32 cross 32 and in the end the output is a RGB image right that is what we interpret the output as which basically 3 channels of size 64 cross 64 okay. So, the gen the this, this is the uh, generator network okay. So, the discriminator is basically the uh, uh, it is it's mirror image basically. So, you start off with 64 cross 64 cross 3 and then you go back to uh, this size of 128 cross 32 cross 32 so on and so forth. So, basically what we see in this in this uh, sequence you go back the same way okay all right. So, that is what you have here. So, all of this this comes here and the second comes there so on and so forth and and the output is a probability of the image being real or fake okay depending on what your input is right. So, there are some interesting um, things in this paper. So, basically if you remember that we have to sample z from a distribution and for generating new images you keep sampling z. So, what they required was that they were able to see a continuous transformation of images as you keep changing z on one axis. So, the generator was able to meaningfully interpolate between z. So, the paper has some very excellent examples. So, you can go and look at them. So, the idea is again just to summarize you have a data set of training samples just we have illustrated it using the MNIST data set and we have a discriminator which is a deep neural network in this case. Um, we have we are sampling noise or the DC GANs paper is 100 dimensions and the generator takes that at input and outputs MNIST digits in this case we are just illustrating it with MNIST digits which is again given as input to the discriminator which has a loss function based on predicting whether the, uh, the inputs come from the training data or whether they are by the output of the generator. So, what is important is that of course, you will not be surprised if the generator provides a sound uh, as output samples similar to the ones or same as the ones in the uh, training data. However, what is observed in most of the um, GANs based implementations of generative models is that very consistently output images which are similar, but not the same as the ones in the training distribution. These are completely new images which still make sense as images and uh, they are able to um, also interpolate meaningfully between the z values that is also a very important point to note. So, by constantly by continually changing z you can obtain a sequence of transformation of images which are again meaningful ok. So, this this property can now has I mean, a lot of work has been done in this area right now. Initially um, we when the paper came out 2014 there was problems with generating larger images. So, Typically, the outputs were restricted to uh, size 64 cross 64 and so on. However, over time, uh, right now there is uh, something called big GANs, which are which is able to give you very large size images at very high resolution. However, of course, the memory requirements and the computational requirements, of course, go up. Okay. So, uh, this concludes our session on uh, GANs. Uh, we will also look at some applications in uh, medical imaging as to what uh, this generative adversarial networks are used for uh, in the medical imaging domain. Um, however, uh, just as just briefly um, GANs have, have a wide variety of applications. Uh, for instance, especially very when I at least in the context of medical images, um, there are situations wherein there are not there is not too much data. So, in which case you can do the semi supervised learning using GANs. So, you can use GANs to generate images like that in your training data set okay. and all the while training the discriminator for a particular task right. So, in this case the discriminator learns um, <coughs> to distinguish between the real and fake images and in the process you hope that the discriminator has learned the uh, an underlying um, representation of your data which then you can fine tune maybe a little, little bit more data for a specific uh, segmentation cl or classification task. So, in the context of semi supervised learning especially for medical image analysis GANs have a wide application. Um, so, these um, GANs can also be used as conditional GANs in the sense that 
you can have an additional input C for both the discriminator and and the generator so that the outputs of both are <coughs> conditional on the, the excess input. So, uh, one such uh, application is the image translation right especially so let us say you have two sets of applications. So, there are some images which are widely available let us say images of a certain anatomy are widely available in a particular imaging modality let us say MR images are widely available and CT images are not. Suppose you have trained a very deep network for MR images right. Now, you have <coughs> CT images of the liver, but you do not have enough data to train a classifier. So, what you would do is to have a GANs like network to translate. Now, GANs have a lot of applications. Um, some of these applications are summarized in this website. Uh, it is a very interesting um, uh, blog. Uh, I urge you to go look at it. However, in the context of medical image analysis, there are uh, this has very uh, crucial role to play, uh, especially in the context of semi supervised learning. Suppose there is a paucity of training data, in fact, labeled training data, then you can use GANs to uh, train a discriminator which learns the underlying structure of the data and then maybe fine tune it with whatever little data is available, right. Because for training the GANs, uh, you do not probably do not need or uh, label data you just have access to a lot of images let us say of a particular variety of a particular anatomy or a particular disease and then you can train GANs with it. But since you lack the labels it does not it is hard to train a deep classifier from scratch. However, once you once you train a generative adversarial network to generate images of a certain anatomy then you can take the discriminator and fine tune it and hopefully it will be a good classifier. So, that is just one uh, very nice application for GANs. And there are other fields uh, like in the case of image translation where there is a lot of interest especially since in the field of medical imaging there are lots of imaging techniques. So, MRI, CT etcetera and in some anatomies and some disease cases there are more uh, images available with a particular scanner. Let us say there are more ima MR images of the brain available or let us say more MR images of the uh, more CT images of liver are available and there is more training data available label training data available uh, for uh, CT of the liver rather than uh, MR of the liver. Then it is uh, could be convenient to set up a GANs network which can translate uh, CT to MR images. So, that you can label using any classifier you have created for the MR and then uh, transfer it back to the CT images. Of course, these are these are um, research problems and uh, with the advent of this uh, GANs network these things are made possible. Uh, in the recent past there have been some developments uh, something called big GANs has come up where which is able to generate larger images uh, because most of the earlier uh, networks following 2014 uh, they have been only uh, able to generate very small size images in the sense 64 by 64 or uh, up to 128 by 128 and the resolution was not great either. Okay. So, with the with more progress made in this field a lot of the interesting problems can be tackled especially in the field of medical image analysis.